You are listening to the Mind Hack Podcast, where we look at the routines, business, and mindset of successful people in an attempt to break down how to live a truly meaningful life. My next guest with me here today is Ali Mavan. He is the founder of the app Sharebert, which is an AI-powered shopping app that pays you to browse, shop, and share items to get discounts from a multitude of brands and high-end products. Ali has had the opportunity to meet and work with boxing celebrities, including Floyd Mayweather and Vladimir Klitschko, who happens to be the longest reigning heavyweight champion in boxing history. In this episode, we first take a look at Ali's childhood life and how he went from shoveling horseshit to a career in boxing for over six years. He founded a passion in selling boxing gloves and has had a multitude of failures and successes. Ali is a very cool cat who has a lot to offer. So without further ado, here is Ali Mavan. Ali, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. What's going on, man? This is Ashwin Gulati. Ashwin, very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you guys. So you grew up and you had a string of, you grew up a little bit poor and you had, you, you were fully growing up. Can you tell me a little bit about that and how that went and how that transitioned you into boxing? Yeah, we grew up definitely a little bit poor. I shared a bedroom with my brother until probably our early teens. I lived in Arizona. We actually moved around a lot, obviously, because you know it's difficult to... We, we, we were born on the East Coast. It's expensive to live on the East Coast. So we ended up moving around. I, I grew up my later teen years in, in Arizona in the middle of the desert, which was exciting. It was actually life-changing. So I, I definitely attribute that to a lot of my uh, drive and background. It, it was just freedom pure freedom. Think about how you were when you were like 15, 16 years old, right? You, you were uh, you were an adventurer, I'm sure, in some way, probably looking to get into trouble. Well, we lived in the middle of the desert, 40 miles from the nearest town. We had horses. It was just a dangerous, scary, horrible place, but in the best way possible. So I'm from Arizona as well, man. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. So I, I'm feeling you. What part of what part of Arizona is particular? Ah, uh, I was uh, 40 minutes north of Kingman, so between Kingman, Arizona, and uh, the Grand Canyon, which is actually I worked at the Grand Canyon as a teen. Oh, geez, dude. Uh, wait, how the hell did you end up over there? Like, what what took your family? They, did they throw a dart on a map and say, "Hey, let's let's go in between Kingman and the Grand Canyon"? Uh, I actually, I worked for, when I was 14, I got my first job. I worked for a horse ranch. I cleaned up um, horse stalls. So I, I literally. Can I say shit? I, I shoveled. I shoveled shit for <laughs> for for my teen years. I got very close with the owners, and they were moving to Arizona. They were relocating their ranch, and our family was close with them after a couple of years of me working for them. So we ended up we went out there on vacation with them, actually just helping them bring the horses out originally, and then um, we ended up coming home, packing up our stuff, and and driving out west to the middle of the desert. And, and so you said, you, did you and your brother do this? as well yep my my family my mom my brother and myself oh so this is like a communal effort you guys were doing yeah yeah it was uh it was definitely a life-changing experience it was amazing i recommend it for anyone if you get any opportunity to just travel just go out to the middle of nowhere and just figure things out that's especially at like that age when you're still really developing mentally I, you just learn so much what kind of perspective did you gain i guess to to for you know yourself uh i mean those are very transformable years and uh you know i could only imagine it must have been kind of difficult to gain perspective when you're isolated but i'm actually really interested because you know most people get their influence from their peers and if you're by yourself working in the desert uh, you must have had your own unique experience. So what was that like? Well, I mean, I did go to school. So, so uh, we, we had a two and a half hour bus ride to school in the morning. Uh, the bus picked us up at 4.30 a.m., two miles from our house. So we had to, if my mom couldn't drive us, we had to walk to the bus stop. That was in the desert, in the dark with tarantulas and rattlesnakes and mountain lions, which was pretty interesting. Yeah, it was just, it, just imagine being dropped on Mars because that's, I've seen the, the rover pictures from Mars and I'm like, wow, that looks just like where I grew up, except, you know, there's no cactuses. I was friends with a kid named Brandon Chi, who's a Navajo Indian kid from the reservation nearby. And uh, 
And my friend Jacob from California had moved from California. His family relocated from California to Arizona. So he lived near, by the, by the way, nearby means within 10 miles of where we lived, they lived. So, so, so that's who we'd hang out with. Right, right. Relatively speaking, I got that. All right. Wow, yeah. that, 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 sounds, that sounds pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, you, you learned, you, I guess the perspective that we got was life. You learned a lot about life. Um, it was before, like we had internet, but it was like pre-internet age. So internet was like a new thing. I remember the AOL discs. So I was already kind of into a web design a little bit at the time, just as a hobby. I was trying to figure that out. But uh, I would come home from school and we'd go and we'd shovel horse shit from 40 horse. By the way, it was a 40 horse ranch. So we were shoveling 40 stalls of horse shit just about time. I mean, I'd say maybe an hour before the sun went down, our friends would show up on their horses. We'd hop on horses that we were, you know, that we had and we were able to use from the ranch. And we'd basically just pick a direction and just go in that direction. And I mean, you could see 20 miles, you could probably go 30 or 40 miles and not, not encounter another human being. So it was purely exploration of the world around you. It was dangerous. There were rattlesnakes, mountain lions, uh, coyotes, uh, tarantulas, which aren't dangerous, but they're, uh, I'm afraid of spiders. So it was terrifying for me to see a spider bigger than my hand. <laughs> uh, it was just completely life-changing in, in that perspective. I mean, you saw, um, you saw like life and death and you really understood the world around you. So, uh, so did picking up horseshit make boxing easier? I would say it made me, it made me physically strong. So that probably helped. Well, like I, I just imagine any difficulties you, you go through in life, you can just remember that you had to shovel ranch ranch life is hard to begin with so like you were we were like running fence posts which is literally like stringing up barbed wire fences and we didn't have a machine to do it with so you're you're literally using like a crank and you're riding a horse and carrying like barbed wire so i mean you tear your finger and you need stitches oh well you better pack some dirt in it and not cry because you have a lot more you have a few more miles of fence to put up before you can go get a band-aid so it was like a very, very tough life, definitely. And and how did that translate into being bullied? If you're somebody that's on the farm, you've got muscle, you've got strength. What happened there? So I was bullied a little bit when I was younger. I would say the ranch definitely toughened me up. It made me uh, recognize that it didn't matter what people said, thought, et cetera. Uh, so it definitely like made me like a mentally strong person and, and obviously, you know, shoveling 40 pounds of horse shit every <laughs> makes you physically strong as well. But I, it definitely, cowboys are tough people. I, I don't know if you've ever seen like a rodeo, like, they'll, like they'll, you know, for example, bull riders, they'll get thrown off a bull trampled and they're just walking it off. They're like, Oh, well, you know, you got to man up and just deal with it. Uh, it that sounds like it must've given you a lot of courage and uh, self-reliance growing up at an early age. Which probably translated fairly well when you started going on your business endeavors, I'm assuming. Is that a far reach to say that? I wouldn't say courage and self-reliance. It just basically taught me, like, you have to just figure things out. You're on your own. You know, we, don't get me wrong. My, my mom was a great mom. She did everything she could, took care of us. But, like, for example, once you're 30, 40 miles from home, you know, in your early teens, you're on a horse. You're in a dangerous place, like... If something happens, you're on your own. You need to, there were, there, you didn't have cell service. We're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so you, you really had to figure things out and, um, and figure out how to work together, you know, with, with the people who are with you that at the time, my friends, et cetera, sometimes you're out on your own and you just, you just need to figure it out. I, I, I'd say I actually have a similar story. I grew up poor as well. And my, my parents died before I ended up turning 18. And so I had this high point where I'm actually trying to run this business while in foster care. And when I was growing up, I started my business based off my best friend, uh, like he was rich and all these things and said, and when I started to become successful, he tried to replicate that success. He tried to build his own business from his mom's money, but he lost interest. And it's so interesting how I've encountered a lot of other young kids and entrepreneurs where they just sort of give up when they're going gets tough. And I look back and I'm, you know, a lot of people look at me like, well, you're, you're so successful. You have a lot of grit and perseverance. But when I look at it, it's I had no backup options. You know, I didn't have a mom's. I didn't. My, I couldn't go live in my parents' basement if I ended up failing. And I dropped out of high school, and I didn't have a college degree, so I didn't have. You know, the most I could hope to be working at was McDonald's. So literally, that was my mindset: is either I make this shit successful, or I'm going to be working at McDonald's. And I don't think I could have bear to, to 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 do that to myself. So it really gave me only one option. And when you have no backup options. All, all, everything else just goes goes out the window. 
uh, you nailed it. You hit it. I mean, you hit the nail right on the head. It's there's nothing else. That's it. You're you're not doing it for money. You're not doing it for glory. You're not doing it because it's interesting or because somebody else is doing it and you want to prove that you can do it too. You simply have to set a vision and just go. And it, I, I see people a lot of times they set like, oh, well, if this doesn't happen by this time, then that's when we pack it up. Like, no, that's when you, that's when you fucking have to figure it out. <laughs> there's no, there's no turning back. You, you don't lose until you quit. There's no, like you literally do not lose until you die or quit. That's it. Those are the only two points where you can lose. And so I I know that that's also translated into having a few failures. But before you went into business, if I'm correct, you went into boxing. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I actually got interested in boxing, A, because I was bullied when I was younger. And B, when I was working at the Grand Canyon, uh, I worked with actually a horse team named Buddy and Rose. Uh, I think they're still there. I spoke to the people. They have the, the Grand Canyon West Rim Instagram page. Buddy and Rose, I believe, are still there. They're, they're basically these giant Belgian draft horses, or, or uh, I believe they're Belgian drafts. And they pull the carriage around the Grand Canyon when you go there and like visit the cowboy town. Anyway, the guy I worked with there, he boxed a little bit in the Golden Gloves when he was younger, and he used to train in Las Vegas, which was nearby. So he's actually the guy who introduced me to the idea of boxing. When we ended up, my family moved back to the East Coast. I was by the way, I was horrified. I was so upset. I loved Arizona. I wanted to stay out there. When my family moved back to the East Coast, Jersey City, New Jersey was nearby where we moved. So I was like, oh, I mean, uh, I've heard of Jersey City and in, in, uh, I know that they have boxing there. So let me go see. And I actually started training at a boxing gym in Jersey City. So that's how I got into it. What, now, was that motivated by uh, the, the fact that you were bullied uh, and you just wanted to be able to fight back? Was it out of hate? Uh, where did that motivation to go into boxing come from? Or, or was it even a passion? At first, I think it was just interest. I wanted to be tough. I wanted to be, you know, like I was already, I, I would say mentally tough from, from being on the ranch, but I wanted to be a tough individual overall. I like the idea of being able to defend myself. So at, at first it just started as kind of like an interest and then it turned into a passion. I was at the gym six days a week. My brother got my brother actually became first a boxer and then he switched to MMA. So he became an MMA fighter. It started, you know, I got beat up by some guy from the Golden Gloves in the gym. My first day sparring. Sparring is when you practice, when you get in the ring and you actually fight. It's supposed to be sustained, so you're not trying to kill each other. This kid was taking it. I could tell he was taking it easy, and he just beat the shit out of me. So, <laughs> so I, I remember getting out of the ring, and I was like, I never want to get my ass kicked like that again. So I started taking it very seriously, training very seriously. Uh, of course, that's where I learned about failure. I got my ass kicked probably 100 times more after that, probably more. If you're not getting your ass kicked, you're not learning. If you're not getting your ass kicked, you're not playing at a high enough level. You, you always need, there's always going to be somebody better than you and you should always be trying to train or practice in, in whatever you're doing. It doesn't matter if it's you're playing a video game or you're boxing or you're, you're a chess player. You should always be playing against people who are better than you because you're going to just inherently pick up on what they do that makes them so successful. So I started training with pro fighters. I sparred with Alejandro Barrio. I sparred with Paul Wallach. These are all. I mean, if you're if you follow boxing, then you know these names. So they're they're big boxing names. Now, do you think ego is uh, is beneficial or uh, can detract from your ability to to be a boxer? It definitely detracts. It definitely detracts. There's. I think like the thing is like Floyd Mayweather. Like he's probably has the biggest ego in not the at all. boxing business, and everybody knows. Yeah, that. no, not at all. Floyd. So Floyd. Floyd does a great job marketing himself. He's very good at being the guy that you want to hate. That's how he makes his money is being the guy that you – people don't pay to see Floyd Mayweather fight. They pay to see him lose, and he never loses, so they keep paying. <laughs> That's how Floyd makes his money. Floyd, Floyd is the most confident person that you will meet, but it's because of the level of training and the level of dedication that he puts into everything that he does. Now, I, didn't you sell – didn't you work with Floyd? Yeah, I actually, I spent, um, I think it was 2015, I spent Thanksgiving weekend with Floyd. We went to Chicago first. He did a, a club appearance and then, and then where the hell did we go after that? Cincinnati, when Adrian Broner was first getting big, we went to Cincinnati and we watched the, the Adrian Broner fight as well. And then we hung out there. 
I'll tell you this, right? So Floyd does club appearances. He walks through the club and whatever else. He he paints this picture that people hate. Floyd Floyd was drinking orange juice the entire time. We got back to the hotel. Floyd did a workout and then took a shower and then ate some like salad and watched a basketball game. Floyd, this is this is while Floyd's flying between places on his private jet while he's doing club appearances. He sticks to his training regimen. This this is a guy who is so dedicated to his craft that that's why that he has that never ending confidence. The man is unbeatable because he never ever ever gives up. And and I don't I mean he doesn't even slip on his training. The guy never gives up on anything. So with that said, I mean um, I know we were talking about ego. Uh, do you? I I don't necessarily think that the opposite of ego is humility. But did you by any chance? I get the feeling that Floyd was a humble person. Do you think, I mean, yes, he does it for the show, but uh, deep down inside, do you think he is very, uh, you know, he doesn't want to attract uh, necessarily the crowd, but he does it because this is what is expected of him? Uh, what are your thoughts about his, him personally? The first time I met Floyd Mayweather, the, the very first time I met Floyd Mayweather, he offered to pay for my flight and my team's flight back to New York. The very first time that I met him. Now, that, that wasn't Floyd trying to show off his money because he didn't do this in, in a crowd of people or in front of a camera. He did it in the elevator at the hotel. So <laughs> Floyd, Floyd is one of the – don't get me wrong. I mean he, he definitely has some level of ego. There's some, there has to be some cockiness to him. But what you see is, a, is, a, is it's like a WWE superstar. It's, it's a personality that is a persona that is – his market share. That's where he gets his market value from. Floyd is, is one of the most dedicated and talented people I've ever met. And while, while like, again, like I said, as he, he does sell himself as this like terrible person, Floyd has earned everything that he, that he's, that he's got every single thing that he's got, he's earned and he continues to earn every day. And he, he even proved it to me that day when I saw him in the club drinking orange juice, he's, he is purely dedicated to his craft. And I think it comes with a certain level of confidence and confidence. Confidence is something that I think any entrepreneur and Floyd is an entrepreneur. Floyd, Floyd makes money so much money on his deals because he gets paid a percentage of everything, the parking, the hot dogs, any drinks you buy at the arena. Floyd gets paid for everything. He's a pure business guy. He's an entrepreneur and any entrepreneur knows that without an overwhelming amount of self-confidence, you will fail because failure comes when you quit. And if you're so confident, so confident that no matter what you do, no matter, you know, you're going to win because you're putting in all of the effort and you're not going to give up, then, then that's how you win. And I think that that personifies Floyd Mayweather very well. Very well said. Yeah. It's the, the art of the craft, the, the willingness to, to go after time and time again, even when you have consistent failure, the ability to stick to your routine and your habits. It's, it's too many people focus on the output of, of trying to achieve a certain goal, but what they should really focus on is building the system that will allow them to achieve that goal. And it's, it, it can be a reverse methodology of how you look at it, but definitely uh, something I didn't know about Floyd. Uh, is, so he has, he has that front. He's, he's very business oriented. That's, that's good to know. Floyd's, Floyd's the guy who will whisper in your ear while he's sparring with you. He'll whisper in your ear and be like, is that all you got? That was your hardest punch, right? That's, that's not Floyd's ego. That's Floyd messing with your ego. Now, if you have an ego and you let that get to you, guess what? You, you already lost. You lost the mental game. Once you lose the mental game, the physical game is, is, soon, to, is soon to end because you're going to so, quit. Uh, it, from what I can gather, I'm sensing that boxing had a huge influence and in- uh, translated very well into your business endeavors. How, how did you go from boxing uh, into your business? Can you elaborate a little bit? Absolutely. I always, I always knew that I was interested in business. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do for a living. I'm moving from Arizona back to the East Coast. The schooling is different. The classes are, are named differently. And because of the way that my classes transferred, I actually got left back. My grade, I'm not going to lie, my grades in high school weren't spectacular anyway. In, in elementary school, they were the best and I got beat up. So I didn't want that. So, <laughs> so my grades in high school weren't, weren't very good to begin with. And then getting left back in my senior year of high school, like having to repeat my senior year was probably the most disheartening thing that I think could have happened. I already wasn't sure about college. I knew my family didn't really have the funds for college. If I was going to go, I really would have had to pay for most of it myself. 
So I started focusing on business late in high school. I tried, my uncle runs a jewelry company, Technoro, really nice guy. They do like wholesale jewelry. Uh, basically, like I got a catalog for him and I was like, I can resell. So like he does wholesale. So I was like, oh, he'll sell to me with no like minimum quantity because I'm his you know, nephew. Let me see if I can like be in the jewelry business. So I tried that out for a bit in high school. You know, I made a couple bucks trying that. I, I've tried everything. I, I tried um, like playing Pharaoh at lunch. That's actually how I used to get lunch money. I would play Pharaoh, which was uh, an old Western card game similar to sort of like blackjack, but not. It's, it's similar. And yeah, I, I was willing to try anything. And being in boxing, I knew that I, I was a pretty good boxer. I was all right. I mean, I guess you have to, like I said, you have to believe that you're good. So <laughs> otherwise, you, otherwise there's no way you're getting in a ring with somebody who wants to knock your head off. But I, I knew I wasn't going to be good enough for uh, pay-per-view, which is where the real money was. It, it, the, the pay discrepancy from the bottom to the top in the boxing industry is massive. So at the bottom, you might make $2,000. I mean, I've seen guys fly, not even fly. I've seen guys literally put in a cab you know, from the middle of Tennessee or, or North Carolina and brought up to, you know, not necessarily New York because they were uh, the athletic director there was very strict. But some states on the Northeast, you know, they didn't have any experience. They just needed a paycheck. They worked at McDonald's at the drive through. Basically, they were they were coaxed into like, hey, can you fight? Like, yeah, I can street fight a little bit. All right, great. We're going to pay you two grand. You're going to just fight this guy. And they'd be basically brought up here, put in the ring with, with guys who had been training for 15 years, <laughs> have, have six straight knockouts, and, and they would just basically get knocked out for $2,000. Whereas somebody like Floyd Mayweather, is he's stepping in the ring to make $200 million. So the, the pay discrepancy was very big. I knew that I didn't want to be a $2,000 guy. I, I could have probably been like a seventy or eighty thousand dollar guy. Some of my friends became six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollar a fight guys, but uh, I knew that that in the long term, for me to make money, I would have to do something that wasn't fighting, but it wanted I wanted something uh, it involved with boxing. So I ended up designing um, boxing gloves, and I tried uh, first selling the boxing gloves at, at my local gym, and you know. I'm going to be honest with you. People probably didn't like them. They just bought them to support me. And, but that, that was enough to, to make me be like, all right, well, why don't you like them? Let's fix them. You know? And that, and that started the drive. That's great. I mean, it sounds like, uh, you learned a little bit of how to hustle in, in high school and that translated into your boxing career, which now translated into your business, man. So that's, that's pretty incredible how you managed to do that. Now, you've also had the opportunity, so you were working with Floyd Mayweather and also Vladimir Klitschko, if I can say that correctly. Vladimir, yeah, Vladimir Klitschko. Who is the longest reigning heavyweight champion in boxing history. Now, how does it, so, so you started this as a business where maybe it wasn't even a business where you were just selling these gloves and was that to support yourself? Was it immediately apparent that you were going to create a business out of this or what was your initial motivation for creating and selling these gloves? Originally, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to start a business. I knew I wanted to be involved with boxing. I knew I wasn't going to be good enough to, to make millions. You know, and, and that's a short, it's a very short career. Boxing is actually just like football, just like basketball. It's a very, very short career. It's very taxing on your body. You, you know, you're working out probably six hours a day, six days a week. And then on the days that you're actually playing, in quotes, because you don't play boxing, you fight. On the days that you're fighting, I mean, you're really... I can't explain to you how hard these guys punch, you know, it, you're getting beaten up. So it's, it's a short career. If you don't make a lot early, you're not going to make a lot. So I knew I want to be involved and I, and I knew that that meant I had to start a business. So originally it was t-shirts. I was like, Oh, well maybe I could do the t-shirt thing. And, and then I saw there were too many people doing that. There was lots of competition, all that, you know, and I wasn't super passionate about it, but about the gloves themselves, I always wanted to get that competitive edge. I wanted to hurt the other guy and, and at the same time protect my hand. When you're punching that hard, I mean, you catch somebody in the elbow and, and that your knuckle is done. You're, you're taking a week off because your knuckles are just getting destroyed if you punch somebody in the elbow. And how did that end up translating into you eventually working with some of these boxing celebrities in the scene? The gloves were good. You, it was basically 
this is this is one thing actually I, a lot of people ask me about is like how do you prototype and build a good product and the answer is uh first you start with what you want and then you show it to the customers and then you change it completely from what you want to what they want and you continuously refine it based on what your customer wants they're going to tell you people are going to tell you a lot of people don't start businesses because they're afraid like oh what if people don't like it and the answer is they're not going to fucking like it when you start they're not going to like it there's no way that you're that you're just magically going to have the best product on earth the second you make a product. It's going to need refinement and you need to – basically you, what you need to do is you need to get that feedback from the people who will buy it and you need to immediately implement as much of it as you can. And your your customers create the product. You don't. Now, did you, any, did you do any sort of business or, or market validation? Because there are people who have a problem and then they go up end up – creating a product, but then nobody wants to buy it because they're solving a problem that they thought people had, but people aren't really willing to pay for it. Now, did you start this as something where you validated it or did you just have this passion and you just knew that this is what you wanted to do? Well, I knew for a fact that there weren't, there weren't a lot of boxing glove brands to begin with uh, right off the get-go. There weren't a lot. So I knew that there wasn't too much competition. The competition that was there was, you know, Everlast, one of the biggest companies ever. Grant, which is a uh, very, very well known in the boxing community, boutique, high, you know, high end expensive gloves. So I wanted to meet kind of in the middle. I wanted something that was going to feel high end, that was going to be priced less than the Grant glove, but was going to be a better quality product than whatever last was pushing out at the time. So that was kind of where I went. People bought it to support me initially, and then they gave me their feedback. And then I basically just built the glove around what people wanted. And at that when it started to pick up, it started to catch on. Um, we had a couple high profile fights, um, we got like served papers once somebody wanted to sue us because his opponent had our gloves on and broke his like eye socket. <laughs> and now while that, while that was like a terrifying moment for me, because that was like a brand new, like, wow, what the hell are we going to do? Like that, it made, it made for great press. It made for really great press. Like every other fighter was like, wait a minute, this guy who's, who, you know, just put on these gloves and broke that guy's eye socket. I want those gloves. <laughs> I want, I want to knock people out really easily. I want those gloves. So that really kicked off. I would say that kicked off like a lot of the interest in our products. And then, um, it just expanded from there. It was a lot of networking, a lot of networking. Uh, it's all about, honestly, it's all about networking. It's about who, you know, I went to every, every boxing match, no matter how small, the venue, no matter how low budget the event, I drove, I, I remember driving to North Carolina. I, I started the company with a girlfriend at the time. I remember we drove, we drove to North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. We drove out West. I can't remember all the States. We definitely went to Georgia, Washington, DC, went to the DC star. We did some events there. I mean, we traveled to the small gritty garbage. I mean, we did a show in a basement once in Philadelphia and we just provide the gloves for free. We were renting the gloves out like because we didn't have enough money to like replace them for each fight but we wanted to get the gloves um seen we wanted viewership we wanted people to to wear them you know and then and then basically get their feedback talk to them about it and and that started basically generating our initial our initial customer base and then everything works in levels so once we got those shows i was uh i was attending community college at the time i start i went to bergen community college i was there for a whole semester and a half and i was in my u.s history class i'm very interested in history i hated that class because they didn't i didn't feel like they wanted to teach and i went to the bathroom in quotes i got up and went to the hallway to take a call and it was basically it was uh, affirmation I, I got my first espn friday night fights deal where my gloves were going to be used on a, on a number of espn friday night fights events on tv and I was ecstatic, right? And the teacher comes out in the hallway and he's like, this is the third or fourth time that, you know, you came out into the hallway to take a call. I think you need to decide what's, what takes priority in your life. Is it, is it class or is it whatever's on that phone call? And I didn't say anything. I went back in, sat down, finished the class of the day. That was the last day I attended college. I just never went back. <laughs> I was like, that guy put that, I really know that guy. He put it in perspective for me. That would have been pretty baller if you just walked out. You'd be like, "Hey, you know, you make a really good point. I'm going to take this phone call." Just... <laughs> oh, I made no, I made no money on that deal, but it was the greatest publicity I could have ever gotten at that stage. Oh man, dude, that hey, that's 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 freaking amazing, man. That so, with that said, I mean, how how have you developed from you know from the beginning of your entrepreneurship to what you are what you're going through now? I mean, do you do you feel like your mind has, your perspective has changed or? that you've just built a lot upon the same hustle that you that's driven you from the past that's made you successful 
you feel like you've changed perspectives at all uh, during the processes you've grown into those different definitely things. grown definitely changed I remember initially my, my thought process going into it was like oh I have the best product I'm the shit I'm the right so like I had a lot of like too much it was definitely cockiness at the time and basically what I've learned over time and this comes from experience is like you want to be less bullshit and more more walk you want to you know what I mean you need to you need to under promise and over deliver we ran into several issues. I mean, there are things that you learn as you run a company. I had promised deadlines that I knew were going to be hard. I would promised pricing that I knew was going to be fucking basically at a loss just so I could get the publicity. And, and then, you know, those deals don't always, they don't always turn out in your favor. If you promise a deadline and then your manufacturer, for example, is a little bit behind, that moves your deadline back even further. So now you, you've owned that that responsibility and you didn't deliver. So it, I definitely learned like a lot about under promising and over delivering. I learned a lot about being, having huge goals, but at the same time being grounded. Uh, I don't mean not pursuing the biggest goals. I mean, when you have a huge goal, you need to be actively locally pursuing it now. That's, that's how you get, you know, like for example, I'm a contributor. I'm a regular contributor to Forbes now. I always wanted to be in Forbes magazine ever since I was a kid. That was like a dream. When as soon as I started wanting to be in business, all I wanted was to like be in Forbes. That was, that was it. That was that means you made it. But that you don't start in Forbes. You start in, in your local newspaper. <laughs> That's that, you know like you can have that goal and aim for that goal, but you need to start locally. Yeah, it's it's all about having that next action. So many of us have this vision or there's there, this passion, of what we want to do and become, but then we don't really stop to think, what is that next action? How can I take that next step to get there? That's a very important step. A lot of people miss. Write it down. Write it down. Give yourself a deadline. I and mean, I don't mean a deadline to quit. I mean, a, you give yourself a deadline to take action on it. And if you don't take action by that deadline, punish yourself for doing so. Hmm. Are, are, are those some of the routines that you have? um of making yourself disciplined because you know i i took martial arts for also about eight years and uh that we should spar we should spar <laughs> you know as long as i get to use my feet you know i think <laughs> <laughs> but no no i i think i think you'll uh you'll knock the shit out of me i'm pretty sure man all right but connor like, connor mcgregor versus floyd mayweather <laughs> Yeah, I'll dance all around you. I will, uh, right? I'll just uh, flap my arms around, all right? And then you can take, you can knock. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cancel at the last second and just, uh, and then I send a replacement. My business partner is Andy Main from uh, The Ultimate Fighter. Yeah, <laughs> season, season. I think it was season thirteen. GSP versus Koscheck. He was on Koscheck's team for that season. As is, that's one of my one of my best friends and business partner. Oh wow, man! See, yeah, hey, it sounds like you've uh, got quite a troop, right? You know, I learned some of my martial arts from playing Street Fighter. That's that's what it, that's what. <laughs> I was like, man, if I do this, I can do Hadouken. That'd be pretty sweet, man. But anyway, you're, you're you're gonna yell Hadouken, but it's. <laughs> I hope that works in a real fight. That's what that's what I. But, like like as as Andy drop kicks you or like. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, damn, that Hadouken didn't work out as well as I would have thought, man. But I mean, you know, despite the fact that nowadays uh, I'm way out of the martial arts game, that idea of discipline really uh, has been a big part of my life. But you know. It's one of those things is I've created habits, small habits along the way uh, to to just develop myself incrementally. Are there any habits that you've developed that you've developed incrementally or any viewpoints or routines that you've had just since you were a child uh, that you've kept with or developed upon for that matter? Um, just perspectives, just perspectives. A lot of things, a lot of things just can't be taught. You just need to learn from experience. So you need to fail and fail. I mean, you're going to fail. Anybody who tells you like you're going to win on your first try is a liar. Okay. If that person won on their first try, they didn't try. Somebody else did it for them. That's the only way that you win on your first try that or just extreme luck, which is very rare. It, it all comes from experience. I mean, extreme transparency is one thing. You need to be totally transparent with people. Even I mean, I, I even made this mistake more recently. I would say like two years ago, I was working on another side of the project. I'd been experimenting with some technology and figured something out. And, and I just didn't share it with my business partner at the time. And it made him quit when he found out. He's like, wait a minute, you've been working on something else without telling me? There was no, like, there was no, 
desire to cut him out. There was no, I, I wasn't, I didn't have any like negative uh, intentions with it, but just not being transparent is enough to make somebody upset and, and basically make you, make them feel like you betrayed their trust. And you really did by not being transparent with them. So I think transparency is very, very important. That's something that I had to learn uh, through business. And unfortunately, you learn it through error. That's that's how the world works. You you learn that the stove is hot by burning your fucking hand. That's <laughs> that's how you learn. The other thing I would I would add on to that is a lot of people get stuck up in feeling like they don't know something. So it's like I don't know how to start a business, so I'm going to go to MBA. I need to go to MBA school, but then I never I never do that. And and there is always a story I like to bring up of, of when I was 15 and just running a business is that I started doing uh, I saw the other hosting companies I was running a web hosting company and they were doing press releases. And so instead of actually taking an online course and looking at how can I write a press release, I just looked at other press releases and then I copied the format, not the words, but the, the general way that they have it listed out. And I've applied that same format to how I do business in general is you look at your closest competitors and you sort of see what they're doing. And, and in my, my current business, uh, the outsourcing business, I had no idea what outsourcing really was until I started to get into it. And so it's only by putting yourself in there and having that hand-on experience can you really really figure it out. And just so many people get stuck in that. I don't know it. I can't do it. I, I have low confidence and uh, I, I have to learn or I have to take all these courses before I learn. You learn so much more by doing the experience and failing in it. My, my partner, Phil, is uh, he's at Harvard MBA. OK, one of the most educated guys, one of the smartest guys I've ever met. I asked him, like, oh, should I take some MIT courses online? It'll make me like it'll fluff my resume, and make me look a little bit better. Right. A little more educated. And he's like he's like, nah, dude, experience. He's like, it was kind of a waste of money. That's that's the high. I mean, Harvard MBA is the highest level. I, if you ask me, there's nothing. What a PhD. They, at Harvard MBA, you're already at the top. You're already at the top. He is the highest level. And even he was like, experience is where it's at. It, don't get me wrong. It gets your foot in the door. It'll help you. I'm not telling you that if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, I'm not that you shouldn't go to school. I'm not even telling you that you shouldn't go to school. What I'm telling you is that it helps, but the the real value in in everything is experience. And really, to any company, your greatest value, the greatest thing that you can bring to the table is simply performance. It's simply performance. You could have the most educated candidate on one hand who's going to take a salary of 100K or 200K. And then on the other hand, you have a guy who just has some experience, but he's going to bring massive performance. Guess what? That guy's going to get a, a percentage check and he's going to make a million and a half this year. You know, that's that's just how it works. Now, have, have there been any books uh, or other habits or, or things that you've endeared, whether through experience uh, courses or books or audio uh, audio books or podcasts, anything that you you kind of consumed that have helped you become the person you are today. Poor Dad, Rich Dad, one of my favorite books of all time uh, by Robert Kiyosaki. Poor Dad, Rich Dad. It's the the, the information is kind of outdated. It's an it's an investing book about buying real estate, which at the time I could never afford. I just wanted to learn how to do it when I read this book because I knew that I wanted to be in business when I got older. He talks about balance sheets and P&Ls, something that most people never learn about in school. I mean, you go to college and you're going to learn. I took an accounting course in college and, and I was learning from a CPA and I learned the basics of a balance sheet. But income and liabilities from a CPA perspective versus a business owner investor perspective, they're, they're completely different things, completely different things. Something that costs you money, even if it's an asset like a house – According to this book, Poor Dad, Rich Dad should be in your liabilities column because it, it is a liability. It's something that costs you money regardless of whether it has intrinsic value or not. Uh, and I agree with that wholeheartedly and I've applied that in my lifetime. It helps, it helps find net profit. It makes you really make decisions that make more sense to increase your cash flow. And at the end of the day, cash flow is the name of the game. You want cash flow. You don't necessarily just want equity growth until you're like in your 40s or 50s. You need cash flow. That's how you make things move. That's how you make money. That's how, that's how you reinvest. You need, you need cash flow. So poor dad, rich dad. Ah, all right, I'm going to say this and I'm going to get some hate for it. And I don't care. Ty Lopez, right? I don't take his courses because I disagree with the inflated price. I, I think he brings value as far as experience. The people that he gets to teach his courses are very smart. Um, I've actually never taken a Ty Lopez course. I've never subscribed to his book or his monthly 67 steps and $67 a month. I think what he sells, I don't see the value in it. 
for someone like me. I mean, there, there's education, I guess. But what I do learn from Ty Lopez is he is a master marketer. Okay. Don't look at what he's selling or what he's trying to teach you. Look at, look at the way he sells it to you. Ty Lopez is one of the best salesmen I have ever seen in my lifetime. And, and what he teaches ever. and what he teaches is really, is really confidence. Like I think a lot of his stuff is shit that he does sell that he does take advantage of some people who, who are just ignorant and they, they want to see this, this, I want to make a lot of money. And this seems like a really cheap way and easy way. Well, I, I want to, I, I do want to, I don't mean to cut you off. Right. Cause I, if Ty Lopez listens to this, right. One of the guys who works with me knows him. So, so if Ty Lopez does listen to this, right. By no means am I discrediting anything that Ty Lopez sells. You know, I, I haven't even taken any of his courses, so I could not discredit that. I did, however, read a summary of his 67 steps. I agree with a lot of the advice that he gives. There are, I'm going to be honest with you, like in, in this world, there are providers and then there are consumers. That's, that's just how it works. You're either a provider or a consumer. You're either providing or you're, or you're consuming. There are way more consumers. Okay. Ty Lopez doesn't necessarily not have value. I'm sure that there are plenty, plenty of people who have taken his courses that he does teach the right mindset that have, that have taken that mindset, applied it, taken advantage of opportunity, took his advice and really made a great living for themselves. But, but here's the disclaimer, but 90% of the time that will not be the case, no matter who you are. 90% of the people, probably even more, 90% of the people who read Poor Dead Rich Dad aren't going to make it. 90% of the people who even are qualified just aren't fucking going to cut it. It's just how life works. It's, it's like being in the African you know, savanna. There are lions and there are gazelles. Whether you want to be a lion or not, it doesn't matter. All that matters, you know, like if you're a gazelle, you're going to get fucking eaten. That's it. <laughs> so I, I can't, I have no hate at all for Ty Lopez in the advice that he sells, I, I considered possibly selling advice at one time. Maybe I do consulting or I did consulting. So that was in its, at its core selling advice. It was just selling advice specifically to businesses, you know, for more money, whereas Ty Lopez is selling it at a lower cost to the mass market. He's the greatest salesman alive though. You, you, I mean, not alive, but like you have to really respect the the amount of salesmanship and how good he is at marketing. He knows how to use social to market. Yes, like I give you that. He is brilliant when it comes to marketing. Everybody almost on the internet knows his name uh, and they, they've seen his YouTube ads showing up constantly, constantly. Here's my garage. <laughs> It, it, and and I think when you, you have certain people who will, who, will, who will buy it and they'll never even look at it, you have people who will buy it and then look at it and then never do anything. You have people who will buy it, look at it, and then they'll try and then they'll fail. And then you have- That's the vast majority. The, the three that you named, that's 99% of them. And then you have people who, who will be successful and they either go on two ends. They're either selling legitimate information and they're actually helping people because they're truly they're truly knowledgeable and passionate about a certain topic. And Ty Lopez teaches them how to have that self-confidence and to teach that. And then he also teaches a lot of bad marketers who are just selling, uh, honestly, not very good information. Yes. Yeah, I get it. Yes. Yes. You get it. You get it. Yeah. And so, so my only concern is, is, you know, I, I would want to sell an info product. It's something I, I've wanted to do, but I always kind of keep coming back to whether it's not, I have low confidence in what I can offer to people who will buy it, or is there an ethical moral concern with taking people's money? If, I, and I, I know like th there's people like Ramit Sethi who he's, he literally says on his landing pages that, you know, if you can't afford this, if this is going to put you broke, do not buy this course. That's all right. That's, that's where I, that's where I feel about it too. Like that's where I have my dilemma is I know, knowing that the vast majority of people are going to fail and knowing that the vast majority of people who buy into these courses, for example, like they're not necessarily making a ton of extra money. When I'm doing business consulting, you know, you have a business that's operating, they have cash coming in and they're basically trying to refine their process. Whereas a lot of these people are, are just dreamers who are trying to get somewhere they, they haven't found their place in life. A lot of them are, you know, 18, 19 years old. They haven't really figured out what to do yet. And that, that is a, a person that I don't want to take a thousand dollars from because that person could really use that thousand dollars to really invest in themselves. Uh, any of the information that he's teaching can be found for free. So I understand some people need a class, they need a course, but if you need a class, a course, and you need somebody to teach you step by step, then you're probably not cut out for business to begin with. Yeah, and that just goes back to my press release example of I didn't take 
any fucking course in order to figure out how to be successful in business. I just went out and did it. And, and I'm gonna re, I'm gonna repost this and I'm gonna tag him in it as well. Okay. And, and, and my and my advice to you when it comes to this idea of making a course or not is I've always looked at Tim Ferriss as sort of the, this very meticulous, very strategic person. And the thing that he's never done up to this point, he's never sold an online course. And I think if you do it, you kind of sell your brand short because you have people who will buy your book and they'll listen to your podcast. But if you're selling a a thousand dollar course or a five hundred dollar course, then people are gonna think, oh, this guy's trying to sell me that. And then it's I love. His book, Four Hour Work Week, is one of my one of my top reads. Also, and, and it, it's it's I think books are great, podcasts are great, and just when you get into that selling the online course, I think it it sort of devalues your potential as a brand in terms of how far you can reach because some people are going to think that oh you're just a scammy internet marketing salesperson, which you, you which you might certainly might not be, but if you're selling an internet marketing product, it just has such a a bad sort of a rap now, and I think people like Ty Lopez as much as I respect his success and his marketing brilliance. He sort of envelops the whole, like he sort of scars the the marketing industry with that that idea. It's it's negative. It's negative connotation because the vast majority of people who buy into it aren't going to succeed. Um, if I if I sold information like sold like info uh, consulting like that at, at you know the rate that at a high price like that thousand dollars four or five figures for a course, knowing that the vast majority of people aren't going to succeed, and I know that my who are your first customers in any business. They're your friends and family, right? So like the people who want to support me that have a very low chance of success, the first people who give me their hard-earned money are going to be my friends and family. I can't – I don't want to put them in a position and, and see them fail. You know, that's – I think that's my my discourse with it. And and by the way, going back to 4-Hour Work Week with Tim Ferriss and with Poor Dad, Rich Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. I'll tag both of those guys as well. Uh, I'm a big fan of Robert Kiyosaki. I'll, both of them – like multi-level marketing, I'm a I'm a I'm a big hater of multi-level marketing. I do not like the business model. I, I think it preys upon again friends and family, but in a negative way. I, I'm hugely against multi-level marketing. So even if you read those books on my recommendation, please don't get into multi-level marketing on their recommendation. Mm -hmm. And, and so if there are people listening that, that want to become successful, and, and, and I, I see what internet marketing is capable of, it's capable of teaching a person who's very knowledgeable in a specific industry or wants to help people, and maybe they're already teaching, but it teaches them to increase their confidence in what they can sell because a lot of the people who end up selling online courses, they're not that smart. Like I've, I've talked to some of these people who have these online courses that they're selling for $1,000 and the amount of knowledge that they, that they actually have they created a very shitty course and then they just improved upon it after they got feedback and after they learned more about it. But when they started out, they had no idea what they were doing. Well, that's, that's, that's any product though. You're always going to go to market with a shit product and then you're initially going to, your initial customers are going to give you feedback and that's where you're going to refine. So I think that's the natural, that's like the natural course of business. Yeah. And, and on that note, I think we will go ahead and, and have our goodbyes. And I want you to, I want you to tell me though. So, if, when it comes to this idea of having these online courses, uh, so who would you recommend it? If you have a friend or family member that said that was knowledgeable in a specific area, how would you teach them to go into business and, and do that? W would you tell them? I I recommend reading Poor Dad Rich Dad. I recommend reading Four Hour Work Week. I recommend staying away from multi level marketing. I highly, highly recommend Neil Patel. He's probably one of the best marketers on the entire internet. If you're, if you're a deep marketing guy, you know of him. Um, I think he should be more widespread, but he gives us information away for free. So he's not uh, as popular as Ty Lopez. <laughs> Neil Patel is a very big one. And then uh, Think with Google. If you look up Think with Google, they do case studies a lot of, I mean, Google is probably one of the best marketers of the last decade. So they give away a lot of free information, a lot of case studies. I read probably 3,500 articles a month. And I think that's, that's what you need to do in order to stay on top, to stay ahead of the game, to stay ahead of the curve. I mean, I do that so that we can, so we can take Sharebird to the next level so that I know what to offer, what people are looking for, what trends are. I think it's really important to, to really just read everything you can and all of it's available for free. You can find all this information for free on the internet. Yeah, and we'll, we'll be sure to link to it in the notes below. And sorry, we didn't get a chance to talk about uh, Sherbert. Uh, we'll link to it, and it's basically an, a shopping app that people can use, if I if I recall correctly. It's like it's like Tinder for shopping. It's probably one of the most amazing things on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening, go check it out. And on that note, 
I want to thank you again, Ellie, for, for being on here. It was a pleasure to have you. Absolutely. It's been a blast. It's been a blast. I can't wait to see your, your dentistry uh, podcast. I want to see some dentistry uh, information, teaching people how to run a, a dentist office as well. Hey man, it's, it's all in the works, man. This is, this is starting me up for my next podcast. Right? <laughs> so, uh, I'm gonna, uh, you know, maybe go through some failures and then go from there, you know, build upon the products, man. Fail fast and fail hard, bro. Uh, we'll make it happen, but yeah, let's keep in touch, man. If you're ever in Austin, keep that in mind.